I'm going to ask you to pray with me before we go on after such a hard lesson. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord, we ask the anointing of your Holy Spirit on my uh, mind, on my mouth, on our, all our hearts and minds, that we might hear this day what you would have us hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Did Jesus really say to hate your mother? <laughs> that doesn't sound right, <laughs> does it? I mean, anybody agree with that? Just raise your hand. No, I can't. Could there be something lost in translation? I'd love to say that. I've had to learn a bunch of languages, and um, that translating's hard. I, in fact, I'm going to side with many biblical scholars who say, indeed, um, it really has a sense of detach from mom and dad. Some. Okay, but what is Jesus teaching here? I think it might be better captured by saying something like, hold loosely to mother, to father, to spouse, to everything in this world. Hold loosely. I think kids the age of two or three often um, learn a word. It's one word that becomes a favorite in the language. This word defines people, it defines things, all places all around them, and eventually it can define and destroy your life. You know what the word is? Mine! <laughs> mine! <laughs> mine, it seems so simple, huh? That's mine. But really it isn't that simple. Inside that word there's a I'm in control kind of attitude. It's all mine. This is my career. This is my money. This is my stuff. I'm going to make my relationship work. We live in a me-saturated culture. We're not unique. It was true in Jesus' time, too. But it's true today. It's true about you and me. That's where we live. The big problem with that is it's, and it's not just self-centered. And it's not just self-focused. In reality, this whole mind stuff is false. It's a lie. Because it's not mine. It's not yours. None of it is. And it gives us a fake sense of security. It leads us to sort of a white-knuckled grip on the steering wheel of life if we think everything's mine. And Jesus says, we have to hold more loosely to all that there is in this world in order to be his disciple. I don't think that's an easy lesson, but it's easy to say, so I hope you'll remember it. God wants us to hold loosely to all the things of this world in order to be his disciple. In the big book of Philemon, we just had the whole thing read almost. <laughs> Um, we have Paul writing to a slave owner, okay? So this is a little easier example. That's why I thought we'd use it. Paul is saying in a very eloquent rhetoric, which you probably didn't follow unless you're really closely reading it. Um, this man, he's writing to a slave owner, and he's saying, this man, Onesimus, is not your property. He's not yours. He's your brother in Christ. It's time to let go of your claim on him as mine and release him from slavery. That's what Paul's writing to the slave owner. Most of us can understand that. I mean, how many of us here think, oh, it's great to have slaves? Probably not too many. So it might be an easy example, but in the first century in the Middle East, it was, well, it was a radical idea to release your slaves. Today, holding loosely to every relationship, every possession, every privilege that we have may involve sort of like a slave owner holding a slave confronting something we're doing wrong. It might involve that. A claim we're making on other people that's not right. Or like ending all forms of, like ending all forms of slavery. And, and slavery we could define, you know, in all sorts of ways, like exploiting vulnerable people in ways that could be really a, a whole other sermon. Or it might be more simple, 
like counting our most beloved security, our home, our, um, our retirement plans, our best friends, our spouse, our children, counting those as our security. Anything we consider ours. It might confront us when we say, hold Lucy, to be only, to consider these only temporary blessings rather than our security. Hold loosely to all things of this world, but hold tightly to God. So I'm going to offer you a different translation of Jesus' words and put them on the slide up on the screen. It's just a little friendlier. Anyone who wants to be my follower must love me far more than their own father, mother, wife, children, brothers or sisters, yes. More than their own life. Hold tight to God. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. You'll be following the mine attitude. Jesus wants to transform the ways we see and relate to each other. Now, that starts by, by learning to hold loosely our privilege, our relationship, our possessions. Now, as Pastor Chris mentioned, I just came back from Nigeria. I get to go and, uh, in my role, um, learn from Lutherans all around the world. And um, in Nigeria, boy, I couldn't imagine telling you about something different than lo holding on loosely to possessions, to privilege, by looking at our partners there. So there are um, four Lutherans in Nigeria who have gone out, I'm going to look at the next slide with you, to little villages. You, you two aren't going to get any privilege of these pictures. If you want to come around, it's okay with me. And they've gone to these little villages, <coughs> and what they're doing in villages is teaching villagers how to live healthier lives. Really simple things, right? But profoundly changing the lives of the village. And um, so they're promoting health. But each of those four who are going out have left their home. They're going out as missionaries. They're Nigerian, but Nigeria is huge. They've left their home, gone to another region, and the region they've gone to is, is plagued with um, Boko Haram. Have you heard of Boko Haram? Plagued with ISIS. Have you heard of ISIS? Both are active. When I went two weeks ago, they said to me, Pastor Doug, we are afraid. Two weeks before you came, someone was beheaded in that village, someone else was shot in that village. You can't go. You have to sit over here in the city. You can't come to our village because they are after money and they'll see you and think you're rich and they will come after you. So let's not do that. I've gone to the village other times, but this time it was too dangerous. I praise God for my partners who tell me that, but I also praise God for the way they have decided to sacrifice some of the privilege they have. They could live somewhere else, less dangerous and less uh, in poverty. But they've chosen to go to these people to improve their lives in health as a witness to the love of Christ. Let me tell you more. Let's look at the next picture. This, can you tell what it is? You're looking at a little baby, but it's not a fuzzy picture. What are you looking through? Anybody know? A mosquito net. All right. So one of the things these four people teach these villagers is to use mosquito nets. And those mosquito nets profoundly change life. How do you get malaria? A mosquito bites you. And it only comes out at night, those mosquitoes. So, or in the evening or early morning. So, um, if you put it over your bed, you get pretty good protection. And, um, but if I use the mosquito net, and I'm the only one in the village who uses it, is it gonna do me much good? Yeah, it'll help. But there's still gonna be an awful lot of mosquitoes. Because the way the mosquito gets malaria is it bites Pastor Chris, who has malaria, and then flies over to me and bites me and transfers a little bit of her blood to me. And so if anybody in the village has malaria, then I'm more at risk. Because I don't live under that mosquito net all the time that the mosquitoes are out. So it's to get everybody safe, we've got to kind of impose on the, the golden rule. We, we, I think the way it's, it's said is kind of sexist. The man's house is his castle, but it's true for women too. 
<laughs> it's my home, I get to do what I want. I don't, I don't like to sleep under a net. As long as some people in the community are saying that, there's a problem. And let's say they're not all Christian. And many of these villages, there are divides between religion, Christians, Muslims, and traditional religions. And so, uh, let's look at the next picture. Here is a, uh, one of the tra uh, village health workers who's learned to teach people to sleep under this village net, uh, this mosquito net. She's showing her hut to me and saying, look, this is how it all works. But it is about saying, my house is not just my house. And giving that up for the sake of the community that matters. It's a, it's a good thing. And as you do so, the whole village gets healthier. I've had w women tell me, one woman who started training like this, she said, we, I, we asked her, what brings you joy in what you do? And she stood up, she was sitting down, she stood up and she went like this. She said, when I was starting this, teaching people to use nets and other things, lots of babies were dying in my village. But today, zero babies are dying in my village. That's what gives me joy. And every one of those people has been taught by someone coming in by the love of Christ. To say, in the love of Christ, we need to have a difference for everybody. Let's look at the next slide. Water is another big deal, so we try very hard to help get wells going. And so this is the way typically people are, are, are drinking. Uh, that doesn't look too clean. And the truth is, it's not. And uh, so let's look at a couple more pictures. The next one shows how traditionally we bring water back and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to bring some water back to your village. Let's go on to the next one. But this is a different feeling when we can put in a well. And so actually the next picture shows a lot of that feeling. They're kind of dancing in this next picture because <laughs> they're happy about the well. <laughs> and praise God, this is a part of, you know, uh, a wonderful thing. Let's go to the next picture. Uh, I'm going to skip him and come back. Go on. Yes, this is the gentleman I want to show you. And that's Bishop Anne, your bishop over there. I took her to see this well, Anne Spenningson. Um, but this man here, I'll just call him Bulama. You, you, Yakubu Bulama is his name. I'll call him Bulama. Just uh, last June, before I arrived, Bulama is the guy who runs the whole water program. And he makes sure all these wells happen. He's also denying himself by going and doing all these things in the name of Christ, and he could get a better job. But he really believes that this is life-changing for people. Water is life. And he also believes that people are, are, are looking and seeing the love of Christ in what he does. But in June, six men with AK-47s came to his house at 1 a.m. and tried to kidnap and kill him. They were terrorists. It's one of the realities in Nigeria. I'm not going to tell you the entire story, but I am going to tell you that miraculously he survived. I'd rather tell you the whole story, but we also do, we're going to do some more things today. And he survived. And his seven children in the house survived. And his brother survived. And his uncle survived. All in this house by absolute miracles. Absolute miracle. And, uh, but he had to give up the farm that he lived on because he can never go back to that home. And he gave up the house. And I had sat with him two weeks ago and I said, why do you still do this? <laughs> you know? Are you still in this? And he said, I, I'm grieving. You know, my, my, my kids can hardly sleep at night because they're afraid. My wife's terrified. <laughs> There, you know, I never go twice in the same pattern because I'm afraid to. But God is good. And this work is what we are called to do. And um, I said, how are you going to survive without your farm and your house? He said, well, I, I will. We just go on. I think that's holding loosely to the stuff of this life in order to reveal the love of Christ. He feels called to do so. In fact, um, one of the reasons he feels called to do so, I believe, is the Christian witness it's having among neighbors. Today, in these villages I've been telling you about, there are 63 of these villages 
that have what we call community-based primary health care happening, all these things, nets and water and things like that. So about 40,000 people are benefiting from that today. And um, many of them are Christians and Muslims living in the same community. The terrorists who are coming and doing all these awful things are actually um, from the same tribe of those Muslims who are my neighbor in many of these 63 villages. They're all called Fulani tribes. And so very, um, if you weren't in, in, in many communities, when a terrorist comes in and does something awful, the community will react. The Christians will react and be violent against all their neighbors who are of the same tribe. It could be a slaughter. And it's a horrible thing to think about. We don't want to act that way. But because they work together on everybody not getting malaria, because everybody uses a bed net for the common good, because everybody shares a well for the common good, because everybody's washing hands for the common good, and they meet together as Christians and Muslims for the sake of the community's health. They know each other. Well, here's what happened about, I don't know, it was probably early July this year. One of those 63 villages, terrorists came in, they killed a young man, they took his body and put it in a road just to disgrace him all the more. It was a Christian young man. And they left town. But it was a Fulani, a Muslim uh, terrorist really, who came in. The Christians in the community knew it wasn't their neighbor. And some of them led. They went out and they took the body of their beloved child who had been killed brought it back into the community, and they quickly announced to the community, nobody's going to retaliate against our neighbors because they didn't do it. Our Muslim neighbors, we know them. This was somebody else. Just because they're Muslim doesn't mean they did this. That's what they said. In a vigilante style, they sent someone to find that terrorist, and they did. And I don't know the end of the story there but probably I shouldn't tell you if I did. But the truth is, those Fulani neighbors didn't have to run away. And they didn't have to be retaliated against because the Christians said, it's not them, we know our neighbors. And it wasn't them. I think efforts to unite a community in the name of Jesus Christ that leads to knowing your neighbor and loving your neighbor reveals the love of God in Christ. I don't know of a better testimony to your neighbors than what that community did by discerning between people and not letting any old division in the community paint a brush against the neighbor. But that's not happening in every village. It's happening where these community-based primary health care efforts are happening. I come back to you saying, wow, what can we hold on loosely to? Can you believe that family would hold on loosely enough to their child's life to be able to say, we, we loved that child, but it's not going to let us turn everything against everybody. We are still in it for revealing the love of Christ. What does it mean <laughs> to let go or hold loosely I'm going to, for the sake of time, skip the other story so we can go to the black slide. Holding loosely, it doesn't mean viewing things and people lightly, like they're not meaningful. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean not valuing people and stuff in your life. Instead, it means seeing each person and each friendship, each opportunity as a temporary gift. It requires loving deeply. It requires opening our hands. Not holding on saying, it's mine. You're mine. And my security's in you. No. It, re it, it, it requires opening our hands. And saying, how can this blessing reveal your love, God, to the world? It's not all about me. This is a temporary gift so that I can reveal your love to the world. Every relationship or possession you have is only in your hands. 
temporarily. Hold loosely. Christians may be called to hold loosely to their rights and their privileges for the sake of loving other people. Congregations may be called to increasingly model inclusive love that defies the divisions in our culture. Hold loosely. No matter what personal loss you have suffered or will suffer in the future, and every one of us should have an example, well, shouldn't, but does. No matter what you've lost, loss of spouse, loss of boyfriend, loss of girlfriend, loss of job, loss of stuff, I got a promise for you. God is still at work in your life and through your life. God is still revealing God's love to you, no matter how big your loss, and through you, no matter what you don't think you have. God is at work in and through you. The purpose of your life is to know and to reveal the love of God in Christ. Everything else is a temporary blessing. I hold that as a promise, a joy, even though it's sometimes hard to let go. But loosen your grip on the steering wheel of life. Keep your eyes on revealing the love of God in Christ. And God will teach you how to love deeply and hold on loosely. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen.